because we have internalized toxic shame, a lot of men's go-to response is to defend and hide or lie. And again, that, that will just keep the walls of trust broken, you know. Um, it will continue to erode the trust. The only way to rebuild trust is to be honest and to be transparent and to own these places where we've fallen short, where we've you know been out of integrity, where we've hurt the other person in some way. And as soon as we do that, especially for a feminine partner, there's often a huge sigh of relief. Welcome back to the Believe, Be Real, Be Bold podcast. My name is Dave Glazer in Denver, Colorado. My guest today is Soma Miller, creator and founder of The Essential Man. He joins me today to talk about men's fear around reaching out for help and how important and necessary it is for us to do so before we hit rock bottom. Soma shares with us his story about how he proceeded along on his journey of personal growth, uh, occasionally trying psychedelics as a mind-opening tool, and he believes that our relationships are a tool to illuminate the shadow and what needs to be worked on. We also discuss how pain is a sign and the body's way of seeking attention. And we complete our conversation today with shadow work and how important it is for men to address the shadow so that it doesn't leak or erupt in our relationships. We are sponsored by the Center for Shared Insight and Dr. Kristen Hick has published a brand new blog on their website and I encourage you to go take a moment to read about it now. It will guide and help you to communicate your dating goals, which is more important now than ever before. Reach out to the Center for Shared Insight and book your complimentary consultation now. If you're looking for additional support, try out our I Believe private exclusive members only group that meets every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Absolutely free for, for your first week. During that free week trial, you'll save your seat for the weekly call. You'll also get two lessons per week to dive a little bit deeper into conscious dating and how it can benefit you moving forward. Last week, we were honored to be joined by a special guest, which I intend to do about every six weeks bring in one of our experts who's been on the podcast to shed a little bit more light on what modern dating is like and what we can do about it. Last week, we focused all on attachment styles and we dove deep into the anxious attachment style because that seemed to be where our audience was asking the most questions. It was a ton of fun and I cannot thank Dr. Liz Fedrick for joining us last week as our special guest. Again, if you're interested in reaching out for a little bit more support in a group setting, send me your email address, on Instagram. Just DM us today. Without further delay, let's get into today's episode with Soma Miller. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. I'm honored to be joined by, by my guest, Soma Miller. How are you today, sir? I'm, I'm really good. It's been a great week so far. Yeah. Mm, what, what's been so great about it for you? My, my work currently just feels like um, it's really taking off. I'm just feeling a lot of life being breathed into it just from my own intentional moves forward with it and uh just feeling uh i think i i can go through waves of inspiration and decline in my inspiration through this path not not in the work itself but some of the nuts and bolts of putting myself out there so i just feel like i'm i'm in this place where what i'm doing and putting out there feels really aligned with what i want mm. Yeah. That's awesome. And you're talking about the essential man. And uh, now that you're talking about putting yourself out there, how was that cold water immersion or the submerged that I saw in the video you posted? That was incredible. Um, yeah, it was, I, I've been doing cold plunges for a little while, but that was definitely next level one for me. Um, I think what I loved the most about it was just just the location it was such a pristine location and just being out in nature like that um it it just sort of opened something up in me you know where like yeah it was uncomfortable but um it it, it was primal on some level you know it kind of opened up this primal energy to, to connect to nature in such a deep way like that Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where specifically were you? And tell me a little bit about the story uh, around that day. Um, well, yeah. So I, that was at this place called Castle Lake that's in the Mount Shasta area. It's about 90 minutes from where I live approximately. Um, 
So Mount Shasta is just such a beautiful spot that I'd love to go visit and just do outdoor adventure kind of stuff. And um, the story behind that, well, I actually went with my my girlfriend and it was it was probably around March or even April, but it's a pro- pretty high elevation spot. And we, you know, we thought we were going to like go for a nice hike <laughs> for the day. We got up there, there was like snow everywhere. Um, you know, so it was like early spring and we were looking forward to some like wildflowers and getting out and seeing all the green little things popping up. But yeah, it was a few feet of snow <laughs> all around on the trail. So we're like, all right, make the most of it. And so I decided to do a nice cold plunge there. And fortunately, my my beloved was there to film me so I could share it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing that one. It, it looked really intense. And uh, when we're talking about moving along forward on our journey, as you mentioned, you're seeing a lot of alignment come into play right now. You, we're not necessarily encouraging people to go to the extreme and take a cold plunge day one of their journey. <laughs> yeah. How, how long have you been on um, a spiritual path, a spiritual awakening, a journey? Um, describe it for me. Uh, walk me through where you began. Yeah, it's, it's, been a, it's been a pretty long journey for me, to be honest. Like, I think for whatever reason, how I'm wired, maybe how I was raised, um, I got turned on to the spiritual path pretty early, like uh, I was probably around 14, 15. Um, part of it is related to some, uh, you know, I think some ex- experiences of psychedelics as a young man that really kind of opened me up to the the vastness of the universe and the kind of interconnectedness of things and just the the depth beyond just the bubble of reality that we typically see. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was pretty profound to have some of those experiences at a young age um, with friends and kind of the, the connection and intimacy that could come out of going through such powerful experiences together. You know, that coupled with having a couple early teachers that I think could see who I was, you know, um, see that I had some some depth to me that you know turned me on to some some books that really opened me and inspired me. Like I remember in high school reading like uh, "Be Here Now," the Ram Dass book, um, uh, "The Prophet" by Khalil Gibran. That's that's an all time favorite of mine. And um, so just yeah, things like that gave me because I, I grew up in New York State. You know, New York's a little bit more conservative in general right and um it i didn't really have access to these ideas about consciousness that maybe are a little more readily available on the west coast Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, i can definitely relate to that yeah 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 so that i mean that's kind of where it started and um it's been an unfolding journey of evolution ever since you know like it's Mm -hmm. I not not necessarily an easy one much of the time (laughs) (laughs) no when we when we take the veil off it's rarely easy you know quote unquote and um, some of what we see as men in the nice guy syndrome is that we want everything to be easy and we expect it to be that way but that's not the truth at all so are you still using um, mind expanding um, practices with psychedelics now or using other spiritual tools in your toolbox? Yeah, I, I do occasionally um, with, with a lot more intention than I, than I did when I was a teenager. Um, yeah, I do. And I, I use a lot other tool, a lot of other tools. I actually, I think from the age of 20 till probably when I was in my thirties or something, I was completely off of any substances. And that's when I got really deeply into yoga. Yoga has been a backbone for me in terms of my personal and spiritual development, uh, just the 
practice of getting into my body has probably been the most integrative consciousness type of work that I've ever done. You know, psychedelics are amazing because they can really open you up. But a lot of times the, what they open you up to doesn't, it's hard to really integrate that fully into like a real grounded way of being in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I still do experiment a little bit. I've done some micro dosing, um, but it's, um, you know, I'm just at a place where what seems to support me the most in my growth and development is continuing my yogic practice, breath work, which, you know, ties into the yoga, um, along with getting supported by other men. And, you know, just as much as I work with other men, lead other men, offer men's programs, I also continue to immerse myself in environments of other men. And that's, that's a huge piece of my practice. Yeah, yeah same here. I, I can see that the yoga principles on a daily basis would help you um, have that groundedness in a spiritual practice. And then an occasional um, mind opening psychedelic use. Yeah, I, I can see that uh, how that would actually come into kind of your individual path. I like mm -hmm. it. And yeah. um, would you say that your teenage years when you were um, introduced to men's work was a kind of an initiation for you? And the reason why I ask is because men are missing an initiation mm -hmm. in our com modern day culture. And would you call it that? Or was it more by accident? And you, you said that today you're more intentional about certain things. I first got into men's work when I was in my early 20s and I was really fortunate and maybe by some stroke of fate came across it. I was somewhat intentional in calling something into my life. Um, I was going through a difficult relationship at the time. I was a total nice guy, like didn't know how to ask for what I needed. Um, hadn't had sex in like over a year, you know, and that's just pretty, pretty wrong for like a 20, 22 year old, you know? Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was not, not a healthy relationship dynamic, very codependent. And at the time I, I had, I had read a book by this, this man, Maladoma Some, and he was an African shaman that, you know, basically was still living it. He like grew up in a traditional African village, um, was taken away by missionaries when he was young um, and kind of indoctrinated with Christianity, Catholic uh, culture, taught how to read and write and all these other things. He then escaped at a certain point. I mean, on top of all that, like abused and kind of treated really poorly, right? Um, he escaped, I think, when he was 18, went to return to his village. And by that time, like most of the kids are initiated around 13 or 14, um, early teens, puberty. Um, he ended up going through the initiation at that time. And he then later sort of wrote a book about it um, because he's, he had you know, he had this lens into both like Western culture and the language of Western culture and like a, the way that somebody in a tradi traditional African village would experience their life. So that, that just the idea of initiation really inspired me, like, and, and it planted this seed in my mind of like becoming a man or what it means to be a man. Um, and shortly after that, I, Came, I ended up at a talk at some festival of somebody named James Twyman that had just gone through a rite of passage or something of the sort. I think it was through the Mankind Project, um, which I imagine you're familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. And then, um, and then I was like, you know, some something's coming through this, right? So I soon after that and what what was also part of that book 
was this idea of incorporating ritual into our lives, um, which was, you know, his practice that he took out of his culture, right? And, and so that also inspired me. So I, I remember doing, I was actually just kind of a vagabond at the time, traveling around in my van throughout California and Oregon. And I, went out to Joshua Tree National Park, went camping for a couple of days. And I, I did this ceremony for myself under the full moon one night where I just, I said some prayers. I kind of lit a fire and crossed over this threshold. And I said, like, I'm, I'm ready, ready to become a man, you know? And I just, that just happened and I let it go. and. I think a couple of weeks later, I found myself in this town in Southern California called Ojai. And um, on a bulletin board, I saw a flyer for this group of men. They're giving a talk about a, a rite of passage that they just went through. Um, so I went there and uh, heard about it. It was uh, the man that led that it, that process. His name was Francis Weller, and um, was really inspired by what everybody shared. And and they said, well, they're they're going to do another cohort of that. And so I started, you know, started sitting with this group of men. And um, after a few months, we all committed to this year long rite of passage process that was led by. Francis and this other man named Richard Palmer, who mm -hmm. became a, a mentor to me after that. Mm -hmm. And so that, yeah, that was like a real tangible rite of passage for me. And, and I think the biggest rite of passage that it was, like how, how it occurred to me as like a rite of passage was coming into relationship with men and my you know my emotional body which i was really cut off from at the time and and in a sense like healing my relationship with my own masculine yeah yeah i can relate to that a lot and most men fear taking the step forward uh oh, I don't need any work is maybe the mantra that they're saying to themselves that holds them back. And you were very intentional about seeking out a group of men. <clears throat> and I believe that it's a lot of fear of men walk into a room and they're like, oh, these men are my competition. I'm afraid of these men. I'm afraid mm -hmm. of getting close to these men. What are they going to find out about me that I'm ashamed yeah. of? And yeah. I, I believe that fear is what holds us back from from finding initiation process or simply just finding a community of men who are going to push us to be better. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think you also named the other primary thing is it's, it's actually oftentimes shame. Um, you know, it's the fear of being seen as weak or vulnerable or seeing parts of us that we don't really want to reveal. And shame, shame is a big piece that keeps men locked up. That's where I was coming from. You know, I think a lot of men feel so alone in their stuff. Like we think we're the only ones that are fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I often bring that up. It's like, you know, we, we think we're the only ones with issues. But the truth is, like, everybody's got their own shit they're dealing with. It's true. And one of the most amazing things I've learned as a part of a men's group for almost two years now, um, a couple of different ones, is that I'm not alone. And mm -hmm. I'm not the only one that has shit. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I think culturally we're all, you know, pretty dysfunctional and we got a lot of shadows and traumas and things that we're, we all got to do our, our work, you know, and um, it's, the, I try to, it is hard work and it's scary to get into this stuff because it means like we're digging up our past and it's sticky and it's uncomfortable. Um, I try to inspire men to do the work and, you know, I could probably get better at this, but it's not about them. And, and that's what it really means to be a mature man, in my opinion, and to be an initiated man is you got to stop making it about you and make it about something that's larger than you. Um, 
like what do you, what do you want to pass on to your children or your children's children what's what's like the legacy that you're mm -hmm. wanting to leave behind mm -hmm. yeah you you mentioned the shadow in there and i can imagine that there's a lot of men out there that are afraid to go into the shadow out of fear of what they're going to find mm -hmm. but the only yeah. way out is through and we have to go to the shadow yeah absolutely it's it's within the shadow is actually the light and um you know i really believe that our, our deepest purpose will not surface until we go into our pain into our darkness the things that we least want to look at are exactly where we need to go to tap into our power and who we are and what we're, to find what we're here to do Mm hmm. Yeah. So that we can fulfill that legacy and, and chase, uh, not chase, but pursue our purpose every day of our, of our self-led lives. So some of the things that come to mind when we talk about the shadow are our masculine wound, our feminine wound, our pain, our trauma. What else comes up for you when we're referencing the shadow work? Um, a, a lot of things, I think, um, I think there's uh, some of the work that I did with one of my teachers, John John Wineland, who you know we did some pretty powerful shadow work with. Um, some of the stuff. I, I mean, there's there's collective shadows that we all kind of carry on some level, um, and you know there's like the vampiric energy where we're sort of sucking energy off of people or women, you know that. Um, and, and that just occurs as like this need for validation and, you know, this sort of like, she's going to fill some void in me. Um, there's, there's our sexual shadows. So, you know, bringing to light sometimes like the taboo parts of us that are not socially acceptable, but live in our psyche in some way. And, you know, when we don't acknowledge our shadows, they actually have more power and they're more likely to, to act out or leak out in some sort of unconscious way. So sexuality is a big piece that we need to look at as men. You know, we need to look at the part of us that wants to like dominate or, you know, just having this really forceful energy. Um, and, you know, I think that's, those ones in particular are, are really hard to, to, consider that they might live in us in some way you know? mm -hmm. but when when we when I found that I've, I've done that work like I remember I did this practice with with my teacher in front of a group of men where I, um, I kind of acted out the part of me that was just like really desperate and needy and just you know it was kind of that a little bit of that vampiric energy and just to be witnessed in that um it took the charge away from it and i used to have shame of like being needy and and as a result i would show up needy in my relationships but when i actually allowed myself to experience it fully and to to be seen and sort of loved in an unconditional way in that space something shifted for me and and it became something that didn't run my life anymore like it, it made it easier for me to accept that I have needs and and to ask for them when I when they're coming up, you know, to explicitly make those requests in my relationship. Um, and it also allowed me to be able to kind of make light of it, you know, like when I when I f feel that part of me coming up, I can sort of make a caricature of it, not not to shame it, but to like not um allow it to be this thing that i need to be ashamed of but to be able to play with it so it doesn't have so much pressure on me if that makes sense yeah i think i hear you hearing you correctly you're you're not minimizing um the need by giving it a caricature or uh, another recommendation is giving it a funny name so that we so that we can talk to it and play with it you're not minimizing yeah. it in, in any way um but you're also which could be even worse, you're not ignoring it and stuffing yeah. it down so that it, to your words earlier, it leaks out. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, it can shift in energy, especially around like neediness that can feel not great in relationships sometimes, like if that's coming out in an unconscious way to being something that can actually like open my partner, you know, where it, it, she can play with it too. And it doesn't have to be an unattractive quality anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, simply because we're putting a name to it. We're labeling it. Yeah. And we, we're not, there's, there's something about the power of shame. Like when, when we have our own shame around some, something or we're not okay with a certain part of ourselves, what I found is that it's much harder for somebody else to, to be okay with it if we're not okay with it. But if we've come to peace with these parts of ourselves and integrated them, then they, they don't have this negative charge around them that other people have to take on in a way. Yeah, I can understand that wholly. And um, what I think that, what I think you're talking about is a really conscious presence to who you are and, and really self-aware. If somebody is not necessarily conscious to it, I could envision that maybe their intuition is getting sparked up of like, oh, what is behind the scenes here? What is my partner holding that mm -hmm. is possibly they're, they're ashamed of? Yeah. It's almost like an intuitive subconscious energy between the two of you. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, if you're, if you're in partnership with a woman, like in my experience, women are quite intuitive and they, they might not be able to put a name to what's going on, but something just feels a little off for them, you know, and that's often what it is. It's these, these parts of us that are suppressed or denied and they're like, oh, what's, you know, what's creepy about this guy? What, what doesn't feel mm -hmm quite right. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't even like using that term because, because I think, you know, sometimes men can use that against themselves, but, but it, it just occurs as like uh, kind of cringy on, on some subtle level. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, what you're describing that comes up for me is uh, kind of an, a sense of unsafe um, mm -hmm. that it might not be the safest place for uh, that feminine energy to reside in, to, to be in. Is that, does that kind of yeah. like, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I think that describes it really well. And I think a primary need for most feminine partners is safety. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a big part of the quest that I've been on personally is like, okay, well, if, if a partnership doesn't work out and I, continuously hear this phrase of like, I don't feel heard or I don't feel emotionally safe here. Okay. That's part of the shadow that I need to look at here. Uh, Cause if it's a repeated pattern, then uh, yeah. I need to address it before I move on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, our relationships by design are, are there to illuminate the parts of us that are unconscious. That's my, my take on relationships. Um, that, we're going to attract the perfect person that's going to stir the things to the surface that we've pushed down and not dealt with. So um, they're a gift in that way. And, and I think that's often why most men get into personal growth work after they've been out of a hard relationship <laughs> they're like, or, or a few of them, you know, it's like, Oh fuck, like same thing again. Um, and eventually, they choose to own it, you know, take some ownership and have a look at things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm chuckling over here because that was one of the questions I wrote down in preparation for our conversation is I actually phrased it. Why do men hide when they experience rock bottom? But now that you bring it up, I'm almost feeling like that's the first time that they come out of their shell and they're like, Hey, I need, I need some help. Yeah, some, some, I mean, a lot won't, you know, a lot won't. And, and I think this is, I want to speak to this because I think this is really important to address when it comes to men and doing their work and, and going through rock bottom or their emotional pain is we, our, our current masculine culture is one that has conditioned many of us men, many, many men to, um, 
isolate when they're in pain. So it's for whatever reason, I don't know how many generations past, we've been taught that, you know, I think part of it's like we've been taught we need to be strong and we need to have our have it together. And and so if we're going through something difficult, then there's this idea that we need to hide it and that people can't handle it or we should be ashamed because we have issues that are unresolved. And so most men, because of that shame around their pain, around their suffering, won't seek support. And that's why probably why we see a high suicide rate amongst men, a lot of depression. It happens in isolation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you might tend to see more alcohol abuse at that time in their lives as well. Um, Mm -hmm. A numbing or a coping skill that might not be the healthiest for us to come out of it stronger than we went into it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a major thing that I often speak to in my work is that men will use these coping mechanisms that basically just numb the pain. And it could be could be alcohol, it could be pornography, it could be marijuana, it could be social media, Netflix, food, all kinds. Of, there's lots of ways to distract ourselves away from the pain. But, you know, just like I spoke of earlier, like there, there's a gift in going into the pain. And mm-hmm. um, we really need to learn to be with it so we can extract the, the gift. Yeah, what questions do we ask of our shadow? What questions do we ask to go into it? You know, um, I had written down a lot of questions of like, what do men, what are men afraid of? And we've touched on it of actually going into the shadow. But yeah. let's say a man is brave enough to go into the shadow. What does he ask himself about porn? What does he ask himself about masturbation? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, that's, that, I, it's not necessarily how I I would go into it, but yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to respond to that. Um, so it might not even start with a question; it might just start with observing. Like, all right, when when are my tendencies to move towards pornography? And quite often, there's an emotional quality that arises you know it could be overwhelm it could be stress it could be anxiety could be um just self-loathing on some level and and so we need to track ourselves and see when we're gravitating towards these kind of numbing activities and and just notice what's there to start like it might be certain triggers like emotional triggers like somebody says something to us that triggers our shame and then we kind of spiral into that place from there. And I think if there were questions to ask around it, um, you know, I, the, the questions to some degree result, revolve around what, where, you know, what is it you're choosing to look at it for, you know, but I would say if, if you're going to start asking questions, you're probably, uh, looking at how can I get my life more in alignment with my integrity in some way. Um, and, and that's where I would start. Like, is this, is this really in service of who I want to be in the world? Um, is this in service of creating the experiences that I want to be having? Um, is this taking energy away from the things that are most important to me? Mm-hmm. Something like that. Mm-hmm. I can definitely see that uh, the emotions of overwhelm and stress would be out of alignment and integrity for a, lo- a lot of men. Yeah, I mean, I mean, those those are overwhelm and stress. Um, they're usually signifiers that something is out of alignment. Um, I mean, they're. They're natural occurrences for most of us modern people because a lot of us take on probably more than we should but right because we're doing that it it signifies something is out of alignment maybe there's something out of balance in our lives you know and 
and and I would say like pain in general, our, our suffering in general is there to draw attention to something that probably needs to shift or just needs our attention. Mm -hmm. And to, to emphasize again, that to turn to those coping skills that are unhealthy for us is not necessarily the best strategy to move away from that pain. No, no, it's, it's just going to subdue it. You know, it's still going to be there. It's just like a temporary fix, you know, like, it's going to come back and it, and it might come back harder and stronger, you know, turning into some circumstance in your life that is a total mess because you didn't deal with it. So if that's a motivating factor, then like, let that be a motivating factor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it will come and like bite you in the ass if you don't deal with it at some point. That's been my experience and what I've noticed. People yeah, I'm, I'm curious now that we're talking about um, the shadow plus uh, sexual preferences plus masturbation and porn. Um, yeah. I, I see that now if you stuff down that part of the shadow, it will erupt at one point and cause some chaos in your life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll, it might show up as an addiction while you're in a relationship and then your your wife or your partner doesn't trust you, you know. And then she won't open to you sexually because you haven't dealt with this part of yourself. I see that quite common with men. Yeah, even if they don't get busted, there's still going to be that lack of safety and that subconscious uh, intuition that we were speaking on earlier. Absolutely. Yeah. From yeah. Partner. She'll, she'll, yeah. She'll feel it. She'll feel it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another another good reason for us men not to isolate at that time when we're going through something hard. Yeah, it's and, right. I mean, and yeah, if you if that happens, that's that's the moment of awakening for you, right? Like maybe you needed that. So yeah, you don't don't continue to shame yourself. Like, all right, I fucked up. Like this ain't working. How can I get some help here around this? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, let's talk about ownership because that's exactly what it sounds like you're talking about right now. Owning yeah. the thing. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's huge. Um, I just I just taught a relationship workshop last night for a group of men, and this is this is one of the the four pillars of um, relation relational leadership that I've defined, um, which is responsibility and ownership, right? So, um, especially when it comes to areas where we've um, been out of integrity, broken agreements, um, done something harmful to hurt somebody. Uh, you know, a lot of, I still get in this sometimes, like, because we have internalized toxic shame, a lot of men's go-to responses to defend and hide or lie. Um, and again, that, that will just keep the walls of trust broken, you know, um, it will continue to erode the trust. The only way to rebuild trust is to be honest and to be transparent and to own these places where we've fallen short, where we've you know, been out of integrity, where we've hurt the other person in some way. And as soon as we do that, especially for a feminine partner, there's often a huge sigh of relief, you know, like, they can take a deeper breath because you've, you've cleared the thing, you know, and it doesn't always happen right away for everybody. You know, sometimes the wounds run deeper. Sometimes they're carrying baggage from past relationships or, or their father, you know, so sometimes there's, there's more work to do to restore trust, but it starts by taking ownership and just admitting like, Hey, like, this this wasn't cool I, I you know I must have really hurt and I'm very you know I, I recognize that this is just not in service of you or us or where who I want to be mm -hmm. whatever whatever that looks like you know just owning it fully yeah I can totally I can totally get behind that and 
one of the, I mean, shoot, we've talked about so much today, but uh, a typical nice guy will avoid that conflict and will defend and explain away and um, not necessarily know how to repair with his partner. You know, so to your point earlier that uh, relationships are reflections for us and I'm a big proponent of not really knowing somebody or not really knowing yourself until you reach that first uh, big conflict in your relationship. Yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit more about that. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm mm-hmm. getting, getting where you're coming from. Well, we definitely have our attachment styles. We definitely have our preferences in the beginning of a relationship, what we're attracted to, um, how we communicate in a relationship up until that point of conflict, because we have different conflict styles as well. Mm, Yeah. And um, a lot of, like I was saying, the nice guys will avoid that conflict because they don't know how to take ownership and repair. Yeah. 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 And I I love that, that I, you know, never looked at it in quite that way of having different conflict styles, but it, but it makes sense. And um, I think, I think it's true. I think you really, that's really uh, an important pivotal point in, in a relationship, especially if it's a new one to see how you handle conflict and conflict do it to be able to like do conflict well in relationship is, is a really important skill set, you know, cause it's, inevitably going to happen right and <clears throat> i think that's one of those relationship skills that not everybody considers is something that they need to practice and, and learn to to be because because we got to we got to find a way through right mm-hmm. yeah if we've been single for a year or two in between relationships because we know it's just not the right place for us to be in one at that time and then we get into uh a new relationship and we've kind of lost that skill or just haven't flexed that muscle in a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I agree. It, it probably does erode a little bit. And, um, and I, I just want to speak to like what, what feels important to be included in, in that skill set is, and, and this is why I think sometimes it's good for men to have time outside of relationship to cultivate relationship with themselves and, and with other men. Because when we do that, what kind of fortifies at our core is our, um, our own integrity, you know, like what, and what's included in, in my idea of integrity are like, what are our needs, our values, um, our our desires for relationship all of those things should be worth fighting for on some level doesn't mean we need to like get into conflict over them and and i guess what i mean is you know we need to be able to stand for what's most important to us in our relationships if, if we haven't even gotten to the point where we're like you know I value myself enough to, to be a stand for these things. And if, if I'm not able to, to get these needs met in this relationships, then it's just not a go for me. Then we're just going to be going in kind of flimsy and we're just going to probably be compromising. And oftentimes a, a feminine partner will not really want a man that is just giving her what she wants all the time, you know? <laughs> no is a powerful word. Yeah. You know, she might fight for it and she might try to get it, but it doesn't mean she actually wants that. And, and that comes back to trust. You know, she wants to trust that you're committed to who you are. And that's, that's way more trustable than a man that is just like, oh yeah, I'll do whatever I can to make you happy. Mm hmm. Yeah, placating is not the best strategy to make for a long term trusting relationship. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I think, I think we need to be clear, you know, so we're prepared for conflict of like, how, how we need to honor and protect ourselves when we step into it. And, um, and that that includes like, knowing our own triggers, like our own wounds, and the things that are going to get stirred up in conflict so that 
you know, we can set a boundary if we need to and step out. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot, a lot there to unpack around conflict, but you know, it's, it's a pretty foundational piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I know your time's valuable, Soma. So what's the best way for people to get a hold of you if they enjoyed your message today? Um, you could, you could reach out to me directly at my email, soma at the man.net. My, my website is www.theessentialman.net. Um, pretty active on Instagram. I, I, I enjoy writing. So I do a lot of posts on there and that, um, my handle on there is the dot essential dot man. And yeah, those are, those are the primary spots where you can connect with me. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll be sure to put those in the show notes below. And if you want to leave us with one one thing we touched on briefly or that we didn't quite get to, uh, what would that be? Um, I would say I, I, I want to emphasize the importance of relationships with with other men, if you're a man. Um, and I want to emphasize that for multiple reasons. Uh, number one, what I found as the more I've learned to trust other men is a natural byproduct product byproduct of that, excuse me, is trusting my own masculine. So um, it's just it's just kind of an organic after effect of building relationships with other men where you can be transparent and honest and give each other honest feedback. There's, there's sort of a strengthening that happens there. Um, and then it, it becomes way easier to embody that when we bring it into relationship. And, and a lot of women are looking for men that are grounded in their, their masculinity, not in an aggressive, overpowering way, but in a, just a present, um, self-valuing, emotionally available and connected way. And that's a tremendous gift that we can bring as men that again, comes back to that emotional safety piece. So I, I think, I think I'll complete with that. Yeah. Very well said, man. I want to say thank you for that. That was a, that was a very succinct and poignant way to close us out. And I want to say thank you again. Absolutely. It's really, it's been a pleasure to connect with you, Dave. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been my pleasure and, and let's connect again in the next six to 12 months. I know that uh, we're connecting weekly in the Alliance and every other week or so um, through our leadership team. And uh, I'm sure that we can, we can do more in yeah, alignment sure. with our. Absolutely, yeah. man. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot more we could talk about. I mean, I think we kind of just, brush the surface of a lot of deep topics that I think are really important. And I'd be happy to jump on a call with you and take a deeper dive into any, any one of those. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. I'll take you up on it. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Yeah.